Cool. Well, welcome to the Beyond Cinema studio, Mr. Guy Madden, Evan Johnson. Firstly, Fantastic. congratulations on having the film here, Forbidden Room. Yeah. Um, it is, as is the case with your work, a complete um, adventure. Like, oh, thanks. And, uh, and so, like, just talk to me a little bit about the concept and why this is not, like, because a lot of your work you do in short form. Mm -hmm. um, so why have this kind of kind of series of shorts connected through these kind of anatomical passages? Yeah, I, you know, for a long time I've, I've been working towards trying to get leaner and simpler things, and I love the movie Detour, you know, the famous leanest film noir of all time, uh, basically a two-hander in a, in a car in front of a rear screen and then a, two flats in a, yep. representing a hotel room. But for some reason, I don't know, this one, I don't know, we really had to get it out of our system on this one. We just had too much narrative in our heads. And, um, and yeah, sure, we could have taken a lot of our favorite things of these stories we really loved and maybe slowly processed them down until they were one story with our favorite things in them yep. and discarding the things that just wouldn't fit the way a conventional and good screenwriter would do, <laughs> do things. But this time we just, I guess we were under the spell of this um, John Ashbery a bit, the American poet John Ashbery, who loves the French writer Raymond Roussel, who spent a lifetime writing projects of narratives nested within narratives using methods that were secretly his own. And um, we tried to, we just thought it was time to, um, I'd, I'd also seen years ago a few melodramas. There's the one called The Locket that has a story within a story within a story all male stories and then at the very center is a woman's story and at the center of that woman's story is a tiny little vaginal locket that contains all the secret of femininity that affects all the men that ripple out from there and I was really impressed by that and I I took that movie almost as a challenge to see how many stories one could nest within yeah. stories in a feature film yeah. and still pull it off. Yeah. It turns out things go haywire at a certain point yeah. but um, the, the structure we ended up um, using was is pretty controlled and then the melodramas are pretty uninhibited within each one and so maybe on a first viewing it might not even seem like there's a structure at all but it's actually pretty carefully imposed yeah and so you knew which component was going to be within each component like from yeah an we, instinctual we, level. we had we had to for yeah. shooting we had to have yeah. transitions from one movie to another so they had to be planned yeah. ahead of time the actors that came on board to help you with this vision kind of a hodgepodge of all sorts of amazing folk. Can you talk about some of those collaborators and whether they were kind of, uh, w whether this was a case of pulling in friends or, or whether this was an opportunity to reach outside your circle? Um, we definitely went outside our circle because uh, I'd spent my, my entire life, except for this one movie called Brand Upon the Brain, my first foreign film shot in Seattle. Um, but this is the first time I'd worked in France and the first time I'd worked in Montreal and we used actors from those two communities. Udo Kier came in as a friend's yeah. favor. Uh, same with Geraldine Chaplin. But uh, other than that, from the Paris community, Mathieu Amorique, Charlotte Rampling, uh, Ariane Labed, uh, Maria de Medeiros, and uh, it was really wonderful yeah. working with those people. And then uh, the Montreal actors are all from the Quebec star system and they're huge stars. Yep. In, in this one province of Canada. And uh, it was just great to see new faces, hear new voices, and um, I, I don't know, really delighted. Um, so I didn't know many of them, but they uh, were, uh, thank God, we had a great casting director who was friends with a lot of them, knew which ones would be up for an adventure, which ones wouldn't, and therefore wouldn't bother imploring yep. their involvement. And so. Uh, it, it was a joy to cast. It was just a matter of having lunch or coffee with each one, yeah. explaining the project, and they dived right in without any reservation. Um, I love the idea of inviting the public in to be a, like part of the spectacle, at least. How is that like logistically for you guys? I mean, filming at the Pompidou Center and then at the at is it Five yeah. in Montreal, and allowing people to walk through the space. Uh, is it more chaos or more controlled than I'd imagined? More, well, more chaos, yeah. <laughs> um, I was the, on, the, on the parachute guy, made me the first assistant, the first AD, whose job on a film set is to organize everything logistically. And I didn't even know what a first AD was. I looked it up on Wikipedia the night, or two nights before we started shooting, and <laughs> it seemed, seemed kind of easy. 
Uh, but it wasn't, especially not with Damn crowd, that Wikipedia, yeah. they make everything seem so easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Citation needed. It was a lot worse than I thought it would be. But um, and it was yeah, fun, too, and it caused a certain amount of chaos that helps the atmosphere on set. Um, your sets tend to have a lot of atmosphere if you shoot really quickly. One of the reasons you wanted to shoot in public was because uh, if everybody's watching, then you can't let everyone just sit around and eat lunch. Which is what film sets usually are, in my experience. Um, a lot yeah, of waiting yeah. around because there's a lot of slow setups, yeah. but you don't like those. So having an audience there meant that we couldn't take our time to do setups. We just had to keep rolling, shooting. Some of them watched from a balcony above, and so there were pieces of food being dropped on us while cameras were rolling things that made the cut. And it wasn't commentary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Who knows what? Uh, yeah. What that gesture means in uh, another country. Right. Uh, but the, we were also installed right next to a, a fantastic public washroom, the Centre Pompidou uh, basement washroom, um, which was the cruisiest washroom in all of Europe, I'm sure, because there were a lot of marshland mating ritual sounds coming out of there. It was, it was just all part of the, just, just keeping the actors off balance enough so that they didn't have time to go, hmm, this is... Stupid. What did I get myself into? <laughs> but I think I think France is still one of those countries, maybe Ireland, maybe a couple others, where the artistic pursuit is still celebrated to a yeah, certain extent. Absolutely, you can tell. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, Mathieu Amaric started in the business as a first AD before Wikipedia. He <laughs> I learned how he did it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how he did it either. But maybe that's why he had to switch to acting. But whatever. He so he knows the business from inside out. And, and as a matter of fact. At times, he was doing a, your job a little uh, while yeah. while acting. <laughs> but ever, there was a kind of a. I do not project professionalism or polish, and so I think a lot of the actors finally just go along out of sympathy or something almost, or or at least just get into the recklessness. They know yeah. I. They know I need happy accidents. Yeah. And that with happy accidents come unhappy accidents. But I'm a great rationalizer and I just have a way of turning unhappy ones into happy yeah. ones. Talk to me just about the kind of physical feeling of shooting. Like we were talking about just uh, off camera earlier that you live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, and flying off to France logistically. How was that experience shooting in Paris, one of the busiest cities in the world? I was thrilled. It was, I, I, I'm lucky enough, I have great French distributors for all my movies and uh, I get to go there often and I love the city. Um, it's hardly a controversial stance to take that <laughs> you love Paris, but I really do love it and it had been a dream of mine for a long time. I have a lot of friends there and, and my distributors have done a good job of finding fans for me there, so I felt really welcome there. Yeah. And uh, I needed a lot of volunteers. The movie, was, the movie project was horribly under budgeted. Or, or underfinanced, yeah. and so we needed a lot of volunteers, and um, we got them, and uh, it, it felt good. It felt I felt wanted, and uh, which was nice. I'm yeah. not, I don't always feel wanted in my hometown, which is very common, you know, among artists in their hometowns. Yeah, and so it felt good to go to Paris and be wanted. Believe me. Yeah, or to tell you right and receive that lovely honor that they gave you as well. Holy smokes! Yeah. It was yeah. Lovely. Um, so getting that kind of level of celebration as an artist after having kind of You've had like a pretty amazing journey professionally, even finding your way to filmmaking, whether that's you know working, fa you know painting houses or yeah. working at a bank or you know all those sorts of things. Do you find some people say that if I hadn't had those experiences, I wouldn't have ended up where I ended up? Like I needed those, and others are just like, what was I thinking? All those distractions along the way to my yeah. ultimate goal. I wasn't ready to make films when I was you know 22 years old. I'm not saying that house painting taught me much, I guess, uh, because it's not like I was a good house painter. It didn't teach me professionalism or what a hard, honest day's work meant or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, with house painting, you know, just the slightest sight of a shady cloud is an excuse to dive onto your couch and try to sleep through the rain that surely must come and <laughs> right off the day. And um, I feel like making a movie about house painting someday, as a matter of fact, what a profile and cowardice. <laughs> it could have been. There are great, brave, courageous house painters out there. I know. I don't yeah. want to paint them all yeah. with the same brush. Yes. But uh, but my m mine was an ignoble painting career, and my banking career is even worse. I just spent all my time shutting the vault door on myself and weeping. You know. So. So what was the catalyst then? What was the catalyst to being a filmmaker? I like, think what I just. You? Yeah, I just wanted like so many twenty-somethings 
I just wanted to express myself. Yeah. I guess my big fantasy was to be a writer, but I was a good enough reader to know I'd never be a good uh, a writer good enough that I would want to read myself. Yeah. Even so, but when I discovered, just like a lot of twenty somethings do, just the work of Bunuel and Dali and and David Lynch's Eraserhead, just the idea that you didn't have to have high gloss Hollywood um, production values to get just some some good ideas across. You could make a very effective, atmosphere-rich movie that stayed with you long afterwards if it spoke to you somehow with its ideas. I, I thought, well, maybe, okay, since I can't write polished sentences, but maybe I've got some idea. You know, you're arrogant when you're in your 20s, you know, but I, maybe I have some ideas that I can get across. And I did have some that I wanted to try out. I, I realized film is maybe the medium for me, yeah. not writing. And I can express myself. That's all. It was just a need to express myself, which means probably call attention to myself. Or, yeah. I don't know. Or have just the opportunity to go through vaults and pull up amazing fonts and title cards from those <laughs> sorts of amazing old movies. Yeah, basically just a love letter to myself. And to, <laughs> or to classic cinema. Yeah, yeah. By way of really? classic cinema. Yeah. yeah. A little humble. Uh, but yeah, well, thanks for coming and spending a few minutes with us. We appreciate you coming. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike.